All right, everyone. So um, we're going to get started with our pediatric emergency board review. That's going to be run by the fellows today. Um, as you all know, you were given a set of 12 questions to kind of answer through a Google survey. Um, they're part of questions through your EM coach board um, review. And so we're going to go through them today in kind of more detail, give you a little bit more um, ex explanation than what the scope of the question is itself in hopes of teaching you guys a little bit more about pediatrics that way. All right, so since you guys have already seen most of these questions, um, we're just going to go over them real quickly before we go over the explanations for you all. Um, and so the first question, question you guys had was a five-year-old female who came to the emergency room after falling off a slide. Um, the patient is complaining of wrist pain. Initial radiographs were normal, but the patient reports uh, pain, um, persistent pain, and what are the next steps? So you had your answer choices. And this correct answer was actually D, um, splinting the patient, discharging them home, and then following up with orthopedics within one week. Um, so most of you guys got this correct. So out of the 48 that answered, 32 got it correct, about 67%. Um, and the reason why this answer is the correct answer is because although there's no radiologic evidence of fracture, you always want to make sure you have concern for type 1 salsa Harris fracture with persistent pain overlying the growth plate. Um, the x-ray findings may be subtle, or they may, there may be none at all, but if you do see something, you want to look for epiphyseal um, displacement. And the management is always splinting in the emergency room with ortho follow-up. So the picture to your right is actually just giving you guys anatomy of like basic bone. So the metaphysis is always going to be at the top, so this is of the femur. And then you're going to look at the physis um, or the growth plate. And then you have your epiphysis, um, and then your, this is just giving you the knee joint. The one thing I want to mention, though, is that when you're looking at a wrist film, it's going to be opposite because usually when they take wrist films, the hand is this way. So you always want to make sure when you're trying to orient yourself, you're coming from this way, metaphysis, right, then epiphysis. I mean, then um, growth plate, then epiphysis. Sorry, just And so just briefly with that, I want to just talk to you guys about Salter Harris fractures in general, okay? Um, just a brief reminder, Salter, the name itself, um, describes the, can help you describe the fracture types. So the S for Salter uh, for type 1 means uh, straight through. This usually, and it's straight through the, um, the growth plate, okay, or the physis. So it usually affects younger children. Um, it's caused by force applied to the physis itself. It can be difficult to diagnose on x-ray, and it's usually diagnosed clinically with signs of tendinitis just along the growth plate. You may see some swelling or some decreased range of motion um, in the area of injury. Um, remember not to exclude a Salter 1 Harris fracture just because the imaging says normal or the radiologist reads it as negative. Um, the treatment is usually with a cast or a splint with weight bearing is tolerated. Um, the prognosis for this is typically really good. Um, and the fracture heals without need for intervention and really results with complications. Next is a type 2 Salter Harris fracture. Um, so this is the A in Salter, which means above. So the fracture is actually uh, occurring in the physis and then above into the metaphysis, okay? So this fracture extends uh, through and above the physis and the metaphysis, is similar to type 1. Um, it has more metaf uh, metaphysial involvement. Uh, it's the most common type of Salter uh, Harris fractures and occurs in about 85% um, of fractures. Um, it usually occurs between the ages of three and seven years old, um, but it's the most common type over 10. The diagnosis is usually made via imaging, so you can get x-ray, you can get CT, um, you can get MR if needed. Uh, but many times a small part of the metaphysis is broken off partially and forms what is known as like a corner sign on um, imaging. The treatment is often repositioned uh, with closed reduction under anesthesia. Um, and then you may or may not need to go ahead and cast. The prognosis is usually good, and complications are rare unless it is a part of the femur um, 
or the this the this little part. Uh oh, it says PowerPoint isn't responding. Okay. Uh, it's, it looks like it's frozen or something. Um, while we're talking about this, I guess Dr. Gentleman, I like your point about OKT. Okay. I think the osteogenic <laughs> potential for children is much better than it is for adults. So we don't Where typically we? thinking about okay. we don't yeah, typically sure. think about TTing these. Um, the problem that's with cool. all birth plate fractures, though, is that if you have birth plate malalignment, mm -hmm. it means that the birth plate is probably going to die, which means you can have an asymmetric deformity for a child. So. A faulted Harris fracture is a big deal just because of the potential damage to the birth plate. Um, if you have anything that's falter three or higher, you're going to consult ortho. If it's falter one or two and it's non displaced, then you can splint it and have them follow up with ortho. That's really important because you want, instead of a PCP, you want the orthopedic surgeons to see them so that they can make sure that it looks like it's still non displaced or it looks like it's aligned properly and that it continues to heal well. Um, if you have any non-displacement, you will always consult orthopedic surgery. All right. So um, just finishing up what I was telling you guys on SALSA 2, uh, the treatments often just be positioning or closed reduction under anesthesia um, and casting if it's actually needed. Um, the prognosis is usually good. Complications are rare um, unless a distal part of the femoral bone is involved. And then at that point, you can see complications up to 40 to 70% of patients. Um, when you're looking at type 3, um, type 3 um, is through or 2, so you remember the T and Salter, and it's affecting both um, the physis, metaphysis, and epiphysis, right? Sorry, just the, sorry, I said that backwards. Um, I'm just going to hit wait again. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, so type 3 is through, it's going to go through the growth plate, and then um, it's going to affect the epiphysis as well. Um, so it's, it usually separates part of the epiphysis and the growth plate from the metaphysis. Um, so this usually involves older children um, whose growth plates are partially already starting to fuse. Um, it's common in the distal tibia, and you will see this in a, a tilo fracture, which can sometimes be um, missed if you're not paying close attention to it. Um, um, diagnosis, of course, is imaging, whether you want to get X-ray, CT, MR, and then the fracture through the growth plate can only be seen. Um, on CT specifically, if you want to see it affecting the thipsis and then going um, below. Um, treatment usually requires surgery with reduction and fixation with screws. Um, the prognosis for this can typically be concerning, especially if it affects the joint or the cartilage in these children, um, but it will be okay if the blood supply was remained intact. Um, and if the part of the bone that was split, so the part of the epiphysis that was split from the physis, as long as the blood supply was still supplying that area, then the, um, the prognosis is usually good. And then you have, um, sorry, type four. This is the T. This is through or all three elements, right? Um, and in this one, this is where it's an intraarticular fracture that passes through the epiphysis the metaphysis above and the um, epiphysis below. So this is commonly seen in like the medial lateral epicondyles of the distal humerus. You can also see it um, occur in like the medial malleolus area. Um, diagnosis is the same via imaging. Um, treatment here is typically surgical with reduction of the interarticular surfaces. And then you want to make sure you're aligning the growth plate we're typically not going to do this. These kids are going to probably go to the OR, but this is just so you're aware, just kind of remembering what Rosie said. Um, if you're thinking it's type three, four, or five, uh, these are the ones where you're definitely going to get um, ortho on board. Um, a lot of the times, if they're displaced, they're going to have to do open reduction, like I said, via surgery, but sometimes there can, it can be fixed through closed reduction, um, but the prognosis here is poor with the risk for growth arrest. And then your last one is type five, which is a crush injury of the growth plate. Um, so this usually occurs with like a lot of force or if there's like um, severe trauma or like an electrical type shock, um, that's when you typically see growth um, injury, like this kind of crushing injury. The issue is a lot of these are actually diagnosed uh, very delayed because when you look at the imaging, 
um, it's just like a fusion of the girl's plate. So depending on the age of the child, it might, you might think it's a normal x-ray, right? But if you see um, no growth plate and it looks like it's fused and the child's like five years old, obviously that's not normal. So you just wanna make sure you're very aware and you're having high suspicion depending on the mechanism of injury. And if their child is having severe pain in that area, um, a lot of times you actually have to get to imaging and compare uh, the normal uh, bone that was affected with the um, current bone so you can see that there is difference in the physio um, plate. This definitely, definitely is gonna be taken to the OR most, most likely. Um, and the prognosis for this one is actually pretty poor. Um, and that's primarily because it causes growth, growth arrest because the growth plate was damaged. All right, so this is a, a fracture here that I want you guys to see. Um, and tell me, tell me what type of fracture this is. Anyone can yell it out if you see it. No. Looks like it's like two. It is. Yeah. yeah. So if you guys look over here, you have your epiphysis. You're gonna turn that off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you have your epiphysis, you have your physis, and then you have your metastasis, right? Your metastasis is the flare part of the dog. So if you look here, you can see a little bit of a fracture up into the metastasis. And if you look at it here too, you can see that tiny little line right above um, the physis and into the metastasis. So remember type two is above into the metastasis. This is a type two soft and hair structure. I, I think Emily might have got type four because you saw this right here, right? Yeah. It's actually still part of the growth plate. And this is why you kind of need like two images yeah. to really be able to distinguish because the growth plate itself can look kind of weird on imaging in children. Yeah. So I can see why you thought it was a type four, yeah. but just make sure in any fracture, right, you want to look, have two different imaging to compare. And if it looks different on one or the other, then you know, and type two and four are actually pretty commonly like confused. People are like, oh, it's either a type two or a type four, depending on which way you're looking at imaging. So it's like a mistake that's common. Yeah. And then the other thing I'll say whenever I look at long fracture, I just follow the cortex. That's what you'll see in the face. So if you follow the cortex down into the metastasis, you'll see it looks a little blurry at that edge there. Versus if you follow around the, um, the cortex of the epiphysis, the one at the bottom, even though it has like that weird kind of wavy stuff, it still looks pretty intact. And that's kind of the way that you know. But you also have to get a fair, you have to see a fair number of those like weird growth plate waviness to, to feel comfortable saying um, it looks like a normal growth plate. All right, so how would you guys treat this? What kind of fracture is it? Anybody can answer, guys. We won't move on until we get some answers. Splint and auto follow up. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Splinter and follow up with ortho. Yes, yeah. yeah, so splinter cast it. It may or not, um, it may or may not need a, a reduction, whether it's closed or open, but splinting and casting is definitely needed. So just take home points briefly, okay? Salta hair is type one, you're gonna cast it, you're gonna splint it, um, and you, depending on where the injury is, they may need a boot. Salta hair is type two, same thing, cast splint boot. They may or may not need a uh, close reduction if it's, if it's misaligned. Salta hair is type three, you're gonna do open and close reduction, open or close reduction and internal fixation. Um, because remember that this is um, below, um, and so you wanna make sure that if this little bottom piece right here is dislocated that you're actually putting it back in place um, and then type four you have your open reduction and internal fixation and then type five remember this one is often delayed it can require a surgery definitely does and you need to um, make sure that you're realigning um, this fracture all right so the next question so any question that's started it's because the majority of people missed this question okay and uh, this question um, is a little tricky just because it talks about what you do in real life and what actually needs to be done. And on your boards, you wanna make sure you're answering what needs to be done, not what you may practice, okay? So you have an 18 month old female who's coming to the ED after a fall. The, the mother reports that the patient rolled off the couch and hit her head. The patient did not lose consciousness, but um, threw up once shortly after the event. She's now acting like herself, according to her mother. On physical exam, you notice small frontal hematoma. 
and the physical exam is otherwise normal. So what is the most appropriate management plan? So this child can actually just go home after a PO challenge. You don't need to watch them in the emergency room. And I'll tell you why. Age has a big factor um, to do with this. But only about 16% got this question right, so we're going to talk about it in more detail um, when we're talking about PCARN here, okay? So when you look at this PCARN chart, there's two different um, things that you would look at depending on the age. So if you want to go online and you're looking up uh, PCARN, just make sure you're paying attention to the age of the patient. This patient was 18 months old. Um, and so the biggest difference here is the child did not lose consciousness, right? They did not have a severe mechanism of injury. Um, the child was acting normally and neurologically intact. There was no palpable scalp fracture. So now we're moving out of the red and going into the yellow. Um, they did have a frontal hematoma, but remember a frontal hematoma is the only hematoma that gets a pass with PCARD, okay? Um, and then the child was acting normally. This is where it kind of gets different between two years and older and uh, two years and younger because there was a history of vomiting in this question, but this child was 18 months. So that is not something that you're looking at in a child under two years old. Vomiting, a history of vomiting does not fall on the PCARN category. Um, and so the other thing just to note here is that when you're following PCARN uh, for age two and under, um, you just want to make sure the most important part is making sure that they're behaving and acting normally, right? Um, and then keep in mind that if you're concerned about any type of concussion or any type of um, uh, like neurologic injury, you want to make sure that they're having PCP follow-up or follow-up with neuro, um, and that's pretty much it. And then make sure you're just giving good return precautions for return to school if they're in school or if they're in daycare. If they're in daycare. Yeah, the high yeah, risk mechanisms. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, so the high risk mechanisms are if you're in a motor vehicle collision where the the one of the passengers is dead, if you were ejected from uh, the car in the motor vehicle collision, or if there was a rollover. So, and the other is like a uh, high uh, impact uh, falling uh, object. Height. Yeah, a high impact, and then height is the big thing, right? As May was pointing out to me. So if you're less than two years, the hall, if the fall is from greater than three feet. And that counts as a severe mechanism. If you're older than two, you can have a fall of greater than five or less than five feet, and it'll still count as a non severe mechanism. So, really, I mean, when we, and then a high impact flying object like a baseball or something. So, if you think about the severe mechanisms, the MVC stuff is pretty easy to remember because it is, would be concerning if you had someone be ejected, if you had someone die, or if there was a rollover. The high impact object also makes sense, like a basketball is fine, the baseball is hard and dense. So really the thing that you have to remember for PCARN is the um, height. The other thing you have to say about PCARN is it's a clinical prediction rule. So it predicts the risk of a patient having a clinically important traumatic brain injury, meaning something that will require some sort of operative management or at least admission. And so um, if you look at if they're PCARN negative, we will usually say, oh, that means they don't need a CT. That's not actually what it means. It means that the chance of a clinically important traumatic brain injury is less than 0.02%, which then makes you feel, I feel comfortable in that type of CT. You'll see that if the red is cleared and you have this kind of yellow zone where maybe they had some vomiting or maybe they're not quite acting like themselves, the risk of a clinically important traumatic brain injury goes to 0.9%. And that's the decision point where you're deciding whether you're going to CT or whether you're going to ob them. And obviously in fees, we'd rather ob them to make sure they're doing okay. But again, a 0.9% risk that they have a clinically important traumatic brain injury is still pretty low, and that's why PCARN would say OBS versus CT. Um, that's just like a little bit going into the stats of it, but sometimes I'll even tell the parents the statistics to make them feel more comfortable. So more, yeah. I guess more importantly is your return precautions, right? Yeah. Because you are telling them about PCARN, you are talking to them, sometimes even showing them and walking through walking them through the steps is helpful. But the most important thing is to just stress clinically significant, clinically significant. Like the risk of radiation to your child is not worth finding a non-clinically significant fracture, right? So we can CT scan your child, because some parents will still say, I really want it. We can CT your child. We may see a very small fracture, but we're still going to send you home. Was the risk of radiation worth it? Some parents say, yes, I just want to know. You know, and that's when you want to have, make sure you're having like uh, good decision making with them. 
but it's very important to just stress the clinical part because you don't want them to come back in five days because the hematoma got bigger, right? And now you're like, okay, we're gonna CT scan this and CT scan the head. And then you find a very small fracture and the parent's like, well, I was here five days ago. The doctor said there was no chance of, uh, you know, skull fracture. And now we're finding out there's a skull fracture and it becomes this big thing when really it doesn't matter because you're not gonna do anything for it anyway. And the child was doing relatively well. Yeah. It's a good <laughs> it can get difficult though with autistic kids because I have ran into parents who told me they don't always know when the child's in pain because depending on the level of autism like they could just act out accordingly and in those cases just be very careful when you're using it because if mom says I'm not sure I can't really tell then who are you to say that you can tell right so yeah. just I'll just be careful in those specific instances. I think you should treat those kids similar to nonverbal gender kids and err on the side of both the parents and their interpretation, but also on the side of caution. Like I do tend to end up managing in general those kids when they're over. And in that situation, just think about the mechanism. Yeah, exactly. Right? The mechanism. If the mechanism to you is very low, um, you can probably try to rule it out that way if you can't any other way. But if the mechanism to you at any point is concerning, it's probably it's yeah. Right. Great. So I'm going to go through question three and four. So question three, you have an 18-year-old male presents by ambulance to a rural emergency department after a gunshot wound to the abdomen, approximately 30 minutes prior to arrival. Vital signs are heart rate of 95, blood pressure 105 over 75, respiratory rate 18, setting 98% on exam, there's a four centimeter defect of the abdominal wall with visible intra-abdominal contents. What is the best uh, next step in management? So to, we'll go through all of these. Um, I think they're all reasonable things to think about at first, but E is the correct answer um, and I'll go through why. So first of all, just to let you know, most people did get this right, good job, um, but we'll go through why the other answers are not the first step in management. So just looking at abdominal penetrating trauma, um, something to remember, I don't think we always think of this intuitively, but it starts from the nipple line on the anterior aspect of the body and goes to the groin crease. On the side, you go to the top of the iliac crest, um, as well as the anterior axillary line and the posterior axillary line. So you're basically covering from the axilla all the way down to the top of the iliac crest. And then the back, you're going, you're following the iliac crest. Um, so it is maybe a larger aspect of the, um, the trunk than you may have think originally. And then the key to this question was this patient had an indication for emergency laparotomy um, after penetrating abdominal trauma. So just to review the indications, so any patient with peritoneal signs, um, with free air in the abdomen, with visceral herniation, so this patient did have visceral herniation abdominal contents coming out of the hole, um, any hemodynamic instability, so this patient actually was um, hemodynamically stable but met other criteria, um, a gunshot wound that transversed the peritoneum and the retroperitoneum, uh, GI bleed following penetrating trauma, so we're seeing that something affected the viscera itself. Penetrating object that's still in situ or in the body because you have a high risk of hemorrhage when you remove the object. You never want to remove the object unless you're in the OR in a stable position. So to go through the incorrect answer, so um, DPL, it's usually more helpful in blunt trauma, but we mainly use the FAST to replace it. If you were going to use it in penetrating trauma, if you know there wasn't an indication to go straight to the OR um, and if CT was not available, 
you could use it. The threshold would be five to 10,000 RBCs for a positive result. Um, this is not something we would do at our hospital, but if for some reason you were in a rural um, place that didn't have CT, it might be, it might be an option. Um, MTP, um, it's not indicated because this patient is hemodynamically stable. So remember, MTP, even though he's going to probably end up losing a decent amount of blood, he at this point is stable. So we also allow permissive hypotension in um, abdominal trauma in, and in most trauma in general, except for TBI, because you just want to ensure that you are perfusing the brain. And your MAP of 50 in adult patients would be your cutoff. Okay, so a CT scan, um, you know, it's something that I think in most serious trauma, we want to just rush to get the CT but um, it's really good at showing injury to solid organs, but not always visceral organ damage, so the actual GI tract itself. Uh, and the results of the CT in this case are not gonna change your management in terms of going to the OR and getting to the OR sooner is gonna have better outcomes. If for some reason, at this point, an emergent laparotomy was not indicated, a CT with IV contrast um, can help determine both peritoneal penetration and intraperitoneal injury. So if for some reason you weren't gonna take the patient to the OR, you'd actually want CT abdomen with IV contrast. And then probing the wound. So I think, you know, as we're doing our secondary survey, our inclination is to start looking into the wound, see if we can see, um, you know, what's in the abdomen, what is affected. But with a gunshot wound, you're really not gonna be able to see with that shallow surface depth. Um, you really need to go in and do an X-lap and see what's happening inside. Um, it might be helpful in sharp penetrating trauma. So in knife wounds and things, you can see how deep you puncture. You might be able to rule out further injury, but just gunshot wounds, the trajectory is just too um, unknown. Okay, we're going to go on to question four. Any questions on this before I go on? Okay. So question four. So again, this one is starred, which means that um, a lot of people do get this wrong. So to go through it carefully. A 12-year-old male comes to the ER with pain and deformity of his left elbow after following on, on his new trampoline. He's left-hand dominated, denies other locations on pain. On physical exam, his left elbow is tender. His motor exam demonstrates loss of abduction and opposition of the thumb. And the patient has evidence of ape hand and loss of forearm pronation. X-ray shows an acute supracondylar fracture, which peripheral nerve is most likely injured. So there's a lot of options here. The answer is the proximal median nerve, and I'm going to go through why that's the case. The important thing to think about here is on exam, they're telling you it's a supracondylar fracture, and they're also giving you the sensory and motor defects. So 43% um, of people got this right. And so the important thing about elbow injuries is you have three nerves that run through it. So you have the proximal median nerve the radial nerve and the ulnar nerve. So depending on where the actual fracture or injury takes place, those could each be affected. So for elbow injuries, so the proximal median nerve um, is actually the most common nerve injury with supracondylar fracture. It's usually the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a, just a branch of it. Um, so in terms of your uh, neurologic effects, for each of these, you just have to memorize them. There's, I don't think there's really a good way other than just kind of memorizing your anatomy. So you're gonna have loss of your thumb abduction and opposition, loss of forearm pronation, which causes a pan. That's demonstrated in the picture. And then you're gonna lose sensation on the lateral 3.5 digits and nail beds. So that's your half of your pointer finger, uh, your middle finger, your ring finger, and then your pinky finger small. Here. I'm going to go on to the other nerve injuries and what you would see in those. So the next one, so this was an incorrect answer, but another elbow injury um, can affect the radial nerve. This is the second most common injury, and it's usually seen with injury to the humerus or an interior shoulder dislocation. Um, sorry, those are in addition to the supracondylar fracture injury. So here you have loss of thumb adduction, which is the opposite of a median nerve, so that's a good way to tell the difference between the two, and wrist drop. You can't extend the wrist and fingers, and the sensation is on the dorsum of the hand. Then you have the ulnar nerve. So the ulnar nerve goes through the elbow, and it's seen that the injury is seen with flexion injuries that cause supracondylar fraction, fractures. You lose loss of the wrist flexors or weakness of the muscles of the hand, which, shows, uh, which ends up being what we call claw hand, 
which is what you see in that picture. And then you're gonna lose sensation of the fifth digit and the middle half of the fourth digit. So it's basically the rest of the fingers other than the distal um, median nerve injury. Again, this is just memorization of the anatomy and the changes you see. So now the other options actually are things that you see in other upper extremity injuries. So we'll go through the axillary nerve and the distal median nerve. So the axillary nerve, you can see it coming through right at the shoulder. The distal median nerve is at the wrist. So um, for axillary nerve injuries, it's usually with shoulder dislocations or proximal humerus fractures, because remember it comes out right up near the shoulder joint. And you lose loss of arm abduction and flexion extension and rotation of the shoulder and loss of upper lateral arm sensation. For the distal median nerve, these are usually wrist injuries or it can happen, it can happen in carpal tunnel syndrome. Usually you have pain at the wrist, diffuse weakness of the hand, and sensation changes, so maybe not just weakness, but it could be um, pins and needles or burning sensation. A lot of times you see that with carpal tunnel syndrome um, in the first 3.5 digits. Okay, so that's it. Any questions? And really, it's just unfortunately, you just have to memorize the anatomy. I don't think there is a great way to kind of review it other than just reviewing your anatomy every time you see an injury. All right, uh, so we're gonna move on to question number five. So we have a 15 year old male presenting with acute shortness of breath during a basketball game. He has no significant medical history. It's otherwise well appearing with normal vital signs. Which of the following is most likely the cause of his symptoms? Okay, so the correct answer is a pneumothorax. The picture is really not great. Um, but it is the picture that you got on your board exam. Um, so it looks like most of you did get it at 58%, 58.3. Um, so here the patient has a spontaneous pneumothorax. It's demonstrated by this deep sulcus sign that you can see on the arrow. So it's kind of fuzzy for you guys too. Um, but while the picture is not great, you can see that there's some asymmetry um, on both sides of the chest and the arrow is pointing to this, what we refer to as the deep sulcus sign. Um, so the pneumothorax, just in its definition, it's the presence of air between the visceral and the parietal flora. So if the air is entering the pleural and the pressure becomes greater than that of the lung, you get the collapse of the lung. Um, there's two types. There's a spontaneous and a traumatic. Here it's a little bit more clear as you can see that there's asymmetry between both sides of the lung. Um, and you can definitely see like a deep sulcus sign on this picture over here. So we're gonna focus on spontaneous pneumothorax because that's exactly what this patient had. Um, there's a primary versus a secondary cause. The primary, you'll on chest x-ray, you're not gonna see any underlying lung disease. So it's classically your tall and thin males. Um, you can see it in these connective tissue disorder kids who have Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos. Also kids with homocystinuria or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, but when you look at their lung uh, pathology and you look at their lung x-ray, you're not going to see any underlying lung disease. Um, the secondary cause will have this underlying lung disease. So they already have a predisposition um, to have uh, issues with their lung. Um, and these are patients with asthma, interstitial lung disease, cystic fibrosis, or any sort of malignancy. Uh, in terms of treatment, as most of you guys know, um, you usually jump to your needle decompression in your chest tubes and you usually fight over it. But in terms for peds, if it's small, less than three centimeters, the patient is stable, not requiring oxygen, not in any chest pain, not tachypnic, um, there's really nothing to do. So you can watch and wait on these patients as long as they're staying stable. Any questions for this one? Yeah. No, the other thing too, um, for the small is Oxygen. Yeah, that's like a supportive and care. And then in the, you probably in four to six hours want to repeat the x ray and make sure it's not getting bigger. Yep. Yeah, but otherwise, just kind of like surgical intervention multiple times. Okay. Yeah. All right. Question six uh, just notice a star. Um, so we're going to go through this in a little bit more detail. 
So you have a five month old healthy, healthy infant brought to the emergency department after being accidentally dropped from a height of two feet onto wood floor. The patients report no loss of consciousness after the fall and normal behavior at present. Um, the patient exhibits normal mental status. A physical exam reveals no abnormalities. So which of the following is the most appropriate next step? Um, so the correct answer is actually reassurance. But I think um, a lot of you guys, if you also notice in the ED when you, know, you present to us and we ask you what you guys want to do, it's always torn between observation and reassurance and sent homes. And I think that's what I ended up having here. You guys were a little bit split. So we went through PCARN. These are the graphs that you guys are normally used to. We're just going to go through it a little bit more with this question. So the PCARN, the, you know, the rule is to image or not to image. And that's what we're looking forward to. And like, what are we going to do with these patients? So there is a difference between the less than two versus the greater than two. And I think Nay touched upon this a bit. Um, and one of the main difference is the vomiting aspect of it, as well as where you're going to get these hematomas. So with patients, the reason why vomiting is not on the PCARN less than two is because patients have these suture lines. So they don't get ICP symptoms the same way that a fused um, skull would actually get these ICP symptoms. So vomiting is not going to be indicated um, as part of the PCARN data for less than two. Um, we also mentioned that the frontal hematoma is okay. But if they not have a non-frontal hematoma, it's a little bit more concerning in patients less than two. Um, again, this is because if you, you know, you, you know, kids, they have huge heads. Their center of gravity is their head. When they fall, they fall forward. And that's like a normal expectancy from them. The frontal bone is quite tough. It usually can take um, most of these like low, uh, low mechanism actions. So they're going to get bruising in the frontal bone more likely. The question it becomes is when it's non-frontal. And that's why these are the differences between the less than two versus the greater than two. Um, and I think Rosie mentioned this perfectly that, you know, this is a clinical, like this is a risk for a clinical TBI. So this is something that if we have one of these features, clinically, are we going to do something for you or not? So just keep that in mind. She already went through the numbers too, which is great. So in terms of our patient, so we have a drop from a height of two feet, which is not considered a severe mechanism. I think Rosie did a great job explaining the severe versus non-severe. Um, there is no loss of consciousness. There's no altered mental status. There's actually no physical exam finding. So we already knew off the bat, which I think you guys knew too, that there's no imaging to be required. So the question goes between observation versus reassurance. Clinically speaking, well, observation is never going to be the wrong answer if you're suspicious of anything and if you're worried about anything. Observation in the ED is never wrong. For your boards, it can be wrong because you cannot pick both answers. <laughs> so it's usually not indicated in a well-appearing, low mechanism with no signs or symptoms and a stable patient. Um, you can consider it for a patient with, that may have one alarming symptom to you. Uh, or a parent who's just not comfortable being discharged. A lot of our observation can be done with the parent saying, hey, I understand this. I understand the risk. I'm okay taking my uh, child home. I can watch them and kind of see how they're doing for the next four to six hours. This does not mean that you have to keep the child up. This does not mean that mom has to be at bedside at 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. watching their child. It can mean that they're at home and they're observing and they understand that whatever anticipatory guidance we give them, then they're more than welcome to come back if they're worried about anything. If mom is like, I am so uncomfortable with this, I'm so worried, like I, I cannot take my child home, then it is perfectly okay to keep the patient in the ED for four to six hours. But when it comes to your boards, please just know the difference between observation and reassurance because they're more than likely gonna ask you on this. So we're going to move on um, from head trauma to other kinds of trauma. Um, so for question seven, we ask, um, which of the following is the most common primary injury from a blast? Um, this is very good in the realm of everything with fireworks. Fireworks do sometimes cause blast injuries, and that's something that gives us a real world impression of this question. Often when you think blast, you think war zone, um, but blasts do happen even in the inner city. Um, so everyone pretty much got this one. 97% said choice C. 
Um, and choice C was the ruptured TM is the most pro common primary injury from a blast. Um, it's important to go through what are the types of blast injuries that do occur. Um, primary is what you really see on TV. This is the blast wave. Um, whenever you see that Armageddon giant apocalyptic boom, this is that time primary blast that creates a pressure wave that moves through the air. Um, and that causes injury to solid as well as hollow organ. Um, the secondary injury is caused by stuff then striking you as the result of the explosion or shrapnel. Um, tertiary is by when you yourself or the victim are flying through the air as a result of the pressure wave or being struck by something else. And then quaternary injuries are anything not included um, in the above, basically fire exposure, fume exposure, radiation. This is like the quaternary is Chernobyl is where that comes from, uh, that concept. So when going through the types of blast injuries, the most common, as all of you answered, is the rupture of the TM. It does not take very much physical pressure to cause that rupture, only one to eight PSI or pressure per square inch, which is really, really low, okay? Now blast lung, blast brain, blast eye, blast belly, these are all other organ systems that can be affected by a pressure wave passing through the body, but it takes a lot higher pressure cause these other organ damage, and they do not all occur immediately after injury. Um, so if you go through and you think, okay, well, what about blast lung, blast brain? Blast lung, this actually almost can take between 10 and 40 PSI to cause the injury, and it basically re resembles injury to a parenchymal problem, like a contusion. Um, sometimes these do not occur acutely, and you develop them 24 or some period of time later. Um, blast brain, this can occur just because of the pressure wave passing through your skull. Um, but again, you may not actually see external signs of trauma because this is a pressure wave and not actually something striking you. Um, ruptured globe and corneal abrasion both occur um, from eye damage, but corneal abrasion is actually more likely. Um, and blast belly is where you have abdominal injury, um, whether it's acute or delayed, determined is based on how the extent of the injury. But the key here is that with blasts, the lowest amount of pressure is going to affect the first organ, um, or rather the first organ affected is going to be the one that has the lowest pressure required, and that is the eardrum. So it's the first to go. Um, why not the other ruptures? Just going through the other organs, um, the eye is more often going to be noticed with corneal abrasions, which is actually more of like a secondary injury as not as much of a primary injury. Um, and then the belly or the vascular system in the brain um, those injuries are more likely to be caused by something that's non-primary. So a vascular or abdominal injury is more likely to be due to a secondary injury of something striking you, um, cutting through the aorta, cutting through the IVC, cutting through your abdomen. Um, and then TBI um, can basically happen in any of these cases. Um, so when looking at these questions, it's always very important to look at the question stem so that you know what specific thing you're trying to answer. But you guys all got this one right. Um, the second question that I had today was, um, a five-year-old comes to the emergency department after getting a hot pot of coffee spilled all over her body. Um, she's got really severe pain, deep partial thickness burns, um, to both palms and the back of her head. Um, and the patient weighs about 20 kilos. And then which of the following is going to be how you administer fluids based on the Parkland formula. Um, so unfortunately, this is another concept on board review where you just need to memorize it. In the real world, you can always look it up. No one is ever gonna fault you for saying, doctor, I would like to look up the answer, but I know that there is a formula for that answer. Um, moving through this, um, the answer is 440 cc's, which about 50% of us picked. Um, and then there's some variation among the other volume rates. Um, when we deal with burns, um, there's a lot that's been going on in nomenclature land. Um, and nomenclature, sometimes when you use the wrong nomenclature, it makes us look silly. Um, first, second, third, fourth degree is no longer in vogue. Um, we now basically classify burns based on the thickness of the burn, not just a numerical number. Um, and this chart gives you a good idea of how to understand which number correlates with which new burn. So your first degree burns, um, which are basically sunburns, right? We don't even have a classification for them in the new burn system. Um, but second, third, and fourth have increasing depth, partial to full to complete. And this is where you start dealing with your partial thickness burns um, 
that extend through the epidermis and may penetrate into the dermis. The depth of your partial and full thickness burn determine your symptoms. Okay, I just want to remember that. Um, when dealing with superficial, we all know that that's just your painful sunburn. And we don't even really need to think about that. But when you break it into the superficial and the uh, partial thickness category, there's depth differential. There's superficial partial, there's deep partial. You say to yourself, oh, how can I remember this? This is such a pain. Um, but there is a difference. The deeper the burn goes, the more um, blistery, the more wet or waxy it is. Um, but these end up developing lack of pain because you've gotten deep enough to singe off the nerve fibers that actually have sensation. Um, so in your deep partial thickness, you may not have pain. You may just have pressure as opposed to superficial partial where you will have pain um, as well as pressure. Um, and then some other differences in how they look. Obviously, if you get down to full thickness, um, or even higher into the fourth degree, this is a getting down to the bone and the fascia. Obviously, you're not going to have any pain at this depth. Um, so the answer to this question has to come down to the rule of nines. Um, the reason we bring up both the adult and the child in this situation is because the rule of nines is different. Yay, kids are always different, right? Um, so the adult rule of nine is on the left and the right, um, but the child rule of nine here is here in the center. Um, some big differences that we have to focus on on the rule of nines is that the child has a bigger head. So if you look, the adult total head front and back is only 9% in the adult. But if you go to the child, the head is so much bigger in proportion to the body surface area that you end up with 18%. Um, the difference of what you added to the head um, ends up being subtracted um, and distributed around the rest of the body. Um, so the front of the baby is 18%, the back of the baby is 18%, is the arms front and back are 9, and the legs front and back are 14. I tend to prefer that these pictures are hard to really remember when you're in the bay and something rolls in and you're saying, oh, what body percentage is involved? So they develop what we call the Palmar method. Um, it's a little poorly named because really it should mean the Palmar and Fingar method um, because it's better to use the whole hand, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But if you use the patient's entire hand, including the fingers, that is considered 1% of total body surface area. And I have some great articles about why the whole hand and not half hands, if anyone would like that later. Um, once you've estimated the percentage surface area, you go on to use the Parkland formula, um, which tells you your volume of fluid or resuscitation fluid that you're picking is 4 cc's times the percentage in body surface area as a number, not like 0.01, but like one, two, three percent, and then multiply by their weight in kilos. Um, you give half of this in the first eight hours, and then the second half of this in the next 16. Um, so you rush with the fluids early for hot, um, rapid fluid resuscitation. Um, if you've given any fluid in the ER already, like a bolus for a trauma resuscitation, that is subtracted from this 50% of the total volume first. Um, and then when you are trying to calculate the total percentage, um, if it's under, uh, or rather, you're really supposed to use it for non-superficial burns, um, so anything that is not a first degree or not a sunburn, basically, um, and then you can decide to give this IV or PO. Um, in the cases where the total body surface area is less than 15, it's appropriate to use oral hydration. Um, so how did this work? Um, in this kiddo, we said both palms and the back of the head. So we said the head is 18, so half the head is 9, and then both palms with fingers is 1 each, gives you 11. 4 times 11 times 20 gives you 880. You do half of that in the first 8 hours, giving you 440, and half of that in the second 16 hours, giving you 440. Now, what's important to note about this calculation is this does not include maintenance fluid. This is the resuscitation required because of body loss of fluid from open, non-protected skin. Um, so it's really easy to say, oh, I did my Parkland calculation and I did my fluid resuscitation, but then your patient ends up hypernatremic, volume down, and then goes into an AKI because they haven't gotten their maintenance fluids on top of this. And in little kids where fluids are really important to know exactly how much maintenance they're getting, these calculations actually become very important. And I would stress that we don't miss them. Thank you. Question number one. Yeah. What is the difference um, I, so there is a specific weight, um, not 100% sure what that weight is. My suspicion is it's probably between 40 and 50 kilos is when they start switching. 
Um, if you look at your patient and you say, this patient looks like an adult, I think that should be enough for you. Um, and most of the trauma literature says around 12 people say that, and that's what exactly is specific, but usually around 12 or like on the present and like a new kind of So I think this becomes a difficult question to answer because we always say that fluid doesn't hurt you. Fluid can hurt a burn patient. Fluid management in a patient that's being resuscitated for burns is very important and has to be done correctly. So if you overestimate the total surface area, you will give more fluid up front. Now, if you know that you're at your estimation that you're using might overestimate what you're giving, you need to say to yourself, all right, well, I'm gonna do this calculation, I'm gonna give these fluids, but I'm gonna be more careful about are there any side effects from those fluids? I'm gonna to listen to the lungs, make sure we're not developing RALs, look for any evidence of peripheral edema, look for signs of fluid overload early because you are being so aggressive with fluid resuscitation. And this goes back to what we do in the ED every day, which is reassess your patient. Yes, you did the calculation, yes, you started the, you did your whole primary secondary survey and started all your orders, but go back and look at the patient again after you've given them some amount of resuscitation and decide whether to continue or to go back to something more basic. Yeah. Just, to, just to answer the question, Emily was right. It, I just looked it up to it is 12 is what they say. Um, but you also have to remember, like you see patients who are 10 years old, 200 pounds. So when you're in those situations, don't use an age cutoff. I would just say this is an adult child, like weight wise. But if you're going from numbers alone and the child looks appropriate, 12 is the cutoff age. Mm -hmm. Yep. And just as you didn't hear, he was saying follow the year and output, like always. Yeah. Okay. So my next question is question nine, which is a question that um, it seems like was a little bit more difficult, but it's basically a teenage male. He has a stab wound to the left neck. It tells you where it is. It says lateral to the thyroid cartilage. There's no crepitance, but you do see a, you do have a pulsatile mass. The vital signs are otherwise normal. And it says what zone and management pair is most appropriate. So it divides it up into zone one, two, and three, and then offers either surgical exploration or CT angio. So the answer was surgical exploration, and we'll go a little bit more into this, but basically anytime you have a pulsatile mass, that is officially a hard sign of neck trauma, which means that it will require surgical exploration. So it looks like a little bit less than half of y'all got this right. And here we're gonna talk about the zones of the neck. So when we, when we talk about the zones of the neck, you can see zone one is above the clavicles up to the cricoid cartilage. Zone two is cricoid cartilage up to the angle of the mandible. And then um, zone three is angle of the mandible to the back of the head. And that's the point of the lateral view of this too, is to just be able to show like how small zone three is um, because it really it excludes the face. Um, and then this is just another example of the different zones of the neck and the different anatomy that you have in those zones. But uh, focusing on our question in particular, when we're talking about um, any neck trauma, surgical consult early and often, and watch these patients really closely. I liked, I divided the, the kind of the big points that they brought across in the A, Bs, and Cs, because that's the way we think about assessing our patients in general. Um, so uh, the take home points that I got from reading the article is that esophageal injury is often missed and is a delayed cause of mortality. So basically just keep going back and observing your patient, making sure you're not feeling only crepitus, making sure that you're getting um, good imaging. And then if in doubt, intubate early or prophylactically, which I think you guys all would have guessed with any sort of neck trauma that's so close to the airway. And then also circulation, it says CT angio is the test of choice for vasculature. But none of that matters when you have a hard sign of um, neck injury. The other thing I wanna say before I move on is zone two is the most common um, zone to be affected in any penetrating neck trauma. So just from uh, looking over the answers that y'all had, Alone, I think the biggest difference that you had was between uh, surgical exploration or CT angio. So it sounds like everyone knows um, where zone two is, but it's just the matter of the difference between the hard signs and the soft signs. So hard signs should make you consult surgery immediately, and it should make you start thinking about how you're going to take this patient to the OR because it will happen also immediately. So 
for airway, when you're evaluating if they have any strider or hoarseness that implies some obstruction of the airway, you're going to take them to the OR. If there's an expanding or pulsatile hematoma, you're going to take them to the OR because you're worried about airway. Um, if you have massive hemoptysis, which I know is pretty subjective, that's something that's going to be concerning. If you have air bubbling from the wound, then that means you might have an esophageal injury. You might have like air coming from your lungs, so you're going to take them to the OR. Massive subcutaneous emphysema, same thing. And then in terms of the circulation, I felt like most of these were like, if they're in shock, you're going to take them to the OR. But the thing that I thought was helpful, um, stroke or TIA obviously decreased perfusion to the brain. If you have decreased or absent radial pulses, just implying that um, the vasculature up here is going to be affected. So soft signs should make you closely observe and reevaluate constantly. These, I think, are things that I find scary anyway, but um, um, apparently are only soft signs. So uh, here we talk again about airway, hemoptysis, hematemesis, oral pharyngeal blood, dysphonia or dysphagia. I thought dysphonia and dysphagia as a soft sign was kind of hilarious to me because I would be freaking out regardless. Um, and then dyspnea, sub-Q or mediastinal error, chest tube error. So the interesting thing I thought about between the hard and soft signs are kind of how subjective certain hard signs versus soft signs can be, because you'll notice it says sub-Q air, medial sinal air, and then here it says massive sub-Q emphysema. And then here it also says um, massive hemoptysis versus before it just says hemoptysis. So what counts as massive hemoptysis? What counts as massive sub-Q air? Who knows? Um, but that's why you're going to consult your surgery team. Um, and then uh, CT angio for these soft signs. You're going to want to assess the vasculature to make sure that it's intact. Okay, so question 10. This is a two-year-old female. She's coming in with basically URI symptoms and a fever. You don't see any signs of a bacterial infection, but you do notice bru bruising to both external ears. Lungs sound clear. The rest of the exam is normal. What's the next step for management for this patient? And the answer is going to be social work consult because of the bruising to the ears. And it looks like 58% of y'all got that. So let's talk about child abuse. So um, there was a paper that came out, I don't remember how recently, that talked about the 10-4 rule. And so this is a rule that was developed by looking at patients who are admitted to the PICU, who were either um, had some sort of non-accidental trauma or accidental trauma. And they looked at the patients who uh, were admitted for non-accidental trauma and tried to find up like some common physical exam findings that they could find amongst those patients that were not present in the accidental trauma group. And what they found is that if you have a child who is four years or younger and you have bruising to the torso, the ear, or the neck, that should be a concern for child maltreatment. And the reason for that is if you're less than four years old, the likelihood that you're gonna get bruising to your ears or bruising to your neck or bruising to your torso is pretty low. Where are most of the bruises happening in four-year-old children who are running and playing? Yeah, I see Taylor, exactly. It's gonna be your upper and lower extremities. You're gonna have bruising in those places. You're not gonna have them in the torso, ears, and neck. So you should be worried if you see this. The other part of the 10-4 rule is that if you are less than four months of age, you should not have bruising. And that's because you are not moving. Really crawling and stuff happens around five or six months of age. And even then you're doing like so low extremity mechanisms that you really shouldn't see bruising. So if you see bruising in a four month old, you better be sure you have a very good history for why that happened. Otherwise you should consider child maltreatment. Okay, so for child maltreatment, you should not see bruising in children who are moving. And the biggest question is always gonna be, is the history consistent with the exam? And the reason that I bring up the spiral fracture is that sometimes people are taught that a spiral fracture is pathognomic for abuse. And that's not true when it comes to a toddler fracture, which is a distal tibial spiral fracture. And the reason this happens, usually the age is like for a toddler's age, like it mentioned, but these kids are running, 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 they're unstable, they get distracted easily, they twist, they see something, and then all of a sudden they're unable to bear weight because they cause a distal tibial spiral fracture. So again, is the history consistent with the exam? That is the biggest part of deciding whether you're gonna pursue a child maltreatment workup or not. I actually had a family that came in and they said like the kid bumped his knee against something and then he had a spiral fracture. Of course, that history wasn't consistent with the exam. So we made, uh, we, we did our NAT workup. So this is just really important for you to get a good history from these patients to make sure that you feel comfortable that this child is not being maltreated at home. 
Okay, so in terms of other concerning things for non-accidental trauma, different stages of healing, I'm sure that makes sense to everyone, not consistent with the developmental stage, which is why the four months old and the four years old are important to, to think about when you're thinking about the 10-4 rule. Ribs, obviously kids shouldn't have rib fractures unless they're in some severe sort of trauma. And then the buckle handle fractures, which are noted here uh, and here, are usually from a shearing force. And again, you can imagine that like these small metaphyseal fractures wouldn't make sense uh, without more obvious injury to the bone. Other signs concerning for non-accidental trauma, so looking for symmetry is basically always going to be concerning. Why did it happen to both sides? Um, if there's any pattern, that's also concerning. Why is there a pattern? The other thing that I talk about with burns, if you guys haven't already known this before, if there's no splash marks, then obviously it means it was an intentional dip injury, because if someone spilled something, there should be splash marks everywhere. And that there's a stocking glove distribution that should also be concerning again because it's a dip injury. And uh, over here in A and B, it's just trying to show you that if you have a burn of like the torso and the legs or the torso and some extremity that spares the abdomen, that should also be concerning. That doesn't make sense. And these are also usually because of dip injuries where they place the child in a tub. So they're scrunched up so the abdomen doesn't get burned, but like the buttocks and everything else will get burned. So just something to think about. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so these are our last two questions. I'll kind of focus a lot on question 11 just because this one a few people got wrong. Um, so 15 year old male comes in with penile pain after his penis is caught in a zipper. What's the best next step? So the answer for this one was E. 62% um, of you guys got this one right. Um, so providing pain management, considering conscious sedation, and cutting the clothing around the zipper and cutting the median part of the zipper. Um, so this question was about uh, zipper entrapment. Usually occurs in pre-pubertal boys, so two to six-year-old boys, um, and the um, zipper usually gets caught on foreskin. Um, you really want to focus on pain management here, so you can apply LMX, which kind of numbs the pain. Um, if they do require systemic pain control, you want to focus on IV opioids or intranasal fentanyl um, if there's no IV present. Um, you can also provide 1% um, lido uh, for local anesthesia um, if you're going to do an immediate procedure. Um, and you may or may not want to use conscious sedation. You usually want to use conscious sedation in the setting of patients who um, is moving a lot and making would potentially make the procedure difficult. Um, you do not want to attempt to fully unzip the zipper because that excessive force on the um, penile tissue can actually worsen the um, injury. Um, and you also don't want to reapply um, the evolved uh, penile tissue because that can lead to necrosis and uh, potential infection. Um, reasons to call urology in this case would be if a large portion of the tissue is missing or if there's urethral involvement because um, you really want to um, involve them to kind of promote optimal healing. Um, and then relief of zipper entrapment. So this picture on the bottom kind of shows where to use um, the wire cutting tools to cut the median uh, bar of the zipper. And that generally um, allows the uh, zipper to fall apart at the teeth, which frees the foreskin. Um, you also want to cut uh, the surrounding clothes away from the zipper. That kind of re reduces um, external tension and eases um, manipulation of the zipper. Um, as I mentioned, you can also apply 1% um, lido over the zipper, um, over the zipper-free penile skin, but that's usually after uh, the median bar is removed. Um, and then just anticipatory guidance for parents to um, tell children to, um, or encourage their kids to wear underwear under the pants, which kind <laughs> of <laughs> prevents um, entrapment of the penile skin. Any questions about that one? Um, and then question 12, so 25-year-old male comes in after a high-speed MVC. Um, he presents with right side of chest pain and SOB, um, vitals, um, heart rate 95, um, he's hypertensive, respirators are 28, um, he's hypoxemic to 86% um, with a temp 36.9. You have coarse right-sided uh, breath sounds um, and overlying right side of chest wall tenderness. Um, and the chest x reads uh, patch, patchy opacities throughout the right lung without evidence of pneumo or uh, rib fractures. Um, they do provide supplemental oxygen. What is the next best step? 
The answer for this one was E, which is morphine. Um, and 85% of the majority of you guys got this one right. Um, this question really was about pulmonary contusion and providing uh, pain control um, as your uh, main source of management. Um, so the, mo main, the most common manifestation of blunt chest trauma um, is pulmonary contusion, which is informally known as a long bruise. Um, it usually occurs in unrestrained drivers um, and NBCs um, as a result of deceleration injuries. Um, in this case, there was no um, overlying rib fractures, but they are obvious, um, often associated with overlying rib fractures. Um, and pathophys, um, uh, there's damage to the capillaries, which results in the parenchymal hemorrhage and edema, which is what results in airspace disease and inadequate gas exchange. Um, so this patient did present with the sh uh, shortness of breath, the chest pain, wall tenderness, hoarse breath sounds, and hypoxemia. Um, so this is an example of a pulmonary contusion radiographically. It's generally radiographically evident within six hours of the trauma. Um, and this chest x-ray does show patchy or a diffuse kind of lung opacities here. You can also get a chest CT, um, which would show opacification uh, without cavitation. Um, and then treatment is generally supportive. Um, so respiratory wise, you would want to support them with oxygen and then pain control. The big kind of hallmark about pulmonary contusions in this case is rapid resolution. Um, so they generally resolve within to three days. Um, but once they do uh, resolve, um, they may kind of show, there may be um, evidence of an underlying uh, pulmonary laceration, which is usually evident after the uh, contusion clears. And just briefly, why the other choices were incorrect, are really just considering the mechanism of injury and the clinical picture. So the fact that this patient came in with coarse right, right sided breath sounds and chest wall tenderness, um, no evidence of pulmonary, uh, sorry, pneumothorax or rib fractures, um, and then the read of the chest x-ray. Um, so the other answer choices um, were aspirin, uh, which was um, management for acute coronary syndrome, and then antibiotics, which would be um, pointing at the fact that this patient had pneumonia, which he didn't. Um, and then one quick thing to note is that prophylactic antibiotics are not generally uh, required for pulmonary contagions. Questions? Thank you.